The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We live in a permissive era... No holds barred. All the taboos are swept away. Anything goes. And the sky is the limit. Do you sometimes yearn a little for an older day with a rigid code of living and an automatic acceptance of certain standards? The flag, the Marines, our country right or wrong, and mother with a capital M. Let's ponder that as we listen to this story. mystery drama, The Living Corpse, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Herd Hatfield. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Philadelphia didn't just happen. It was planned. Two main streets, Broad and Market, bisecting each other at the center of town. Four squares in each quadrant, of which the only one we need pause to consider is Rittenhouse Square. To own a house on Rittenhouse Square was to be the creme de la creme of Philadelphia society, and so, by extension, of the world. The Peabody House has been there since the square was built. And the family has never lived anywhere else. Why should they? After all, where else is anywhere? My name is Henry Gerard Flower Peabody. Most everyone says I was born middle-aged. Not to my face, of course. But I don't think I'm necessarily so stodgy. I'm a product of a very special society by birth and breeding... And naturally, a certain decorum must be observed. But even though I was born in another century, I think I've kept up pretty well with the one in which I've lived 79 years of my life, in spite of my isolation ever since Mother died and... and the other. But before they locked me up and threw away the key, all those people would have been surprised to know that I wasn't at all what I seemed. Yeah? What do you want? May I ask to whom I'm speaking? I'm Lieutenant Quinn, Chief of Homicide. Who the deuce are you? A citizen of our fair city in pursuit of his duty. My name is Henry Gerard Flower Peabody V. Good Lord, there are more of you. The name travels in the family. Hey, now, wait a minute. You don't mean the Henry Peabody. I mean the son of... Look, do you mean your mother is Mrs. Peabody? I should certainly hope so. That lives in Rittenhouse Square, the, the philanthropist like that gave all their millions to the church and charities and all like that? The same. Well, well, sit right down, Mr. Peabody. Now, what can I do for you? I don't believe I feel exactly like sitting. You see, I want to report a murder. How about that? You've seen one committed? That's right. You know the victim? Of course. And the name? Megan. Megan? That's all? I don't know any other name. Just Megan. Well, a man or a woman? Don't be silly. A woman, of course. It means child of light. What does? Megan. It's short for Margaret in Welsh. Oh, is that a fact? Any idea who the perpetrator was? I am the murderer. But that was such a very long time ago. Forty-four? No, forty-five years ago. And I'm starting with the end of my life. Perhaps I should start a little closer to the beginning. I was born in 1897 when William McKinley was in his first term. A Republican, naturally. In 1901, when Mr. McKinley was assassinated and Teddy Roosevelt became president, I was five years old. And in 1915, when the Germans sank the Lusitania, I was 19, which made me old enough to be one of the first to sign up when America entered World War I two years later. Mother made quite a fuss. I just can't believe it. 
How dare you, Henry? It was my duty to my country. But without consulting me first? Mother, I am a man now. There's no need for you to go over to those backward countries with their dreadful plumbing while there's a war on. It's too late. I've already signed up and I'm of age. Oh, don't be silly. Jack Pershing is an old acquaintance of your poor dead father's. All it will take is a word from me. No, to... Mother. What did you say? No, Mama. I can't back out now. It isn't just me. It's my whole class. Class is just the point. There's no need for I you. meant my college class. Look, I couldn't back out on Fizzy. Lambert Fizdale has signed up too? I thought he was going to be a doctor. Well, that can wait. And what about your degree? That can wait too. Mama, there's no use arguing with me this time. I've made up my mind. Ah, just a stubbornness, Henry IV, your dead father. Oh, it all comes from that man in the White House being a Princeton graduate. Wilson. Naturally, he got us into the war. He's a Democrat. Now it's up to us Republicans to get us out of it. That's not fair. Nevertheless, it is true. And it's the way I feel. <laughs> As you can see, Mother was quite formidable. But there wasn't any use in arguing with her. Usually it was easier to submit with good grace. But not this time. This time I was going to have my way. Mother always reminded me of the joke. You can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> well, a Philadelphia mainliner dowager is in the same boat. You see, three years of college, my army service, and then back to college to graduate, taught me that what was inside me didn't exactly go with my staid sober outsides. Funny now. Fizz was absolutely different, even though he planned to be a doctor. Well, Henry, I'm certainly glad that's over. What's over, Fizzy old bean? Uh, the war. What war? The one we've just... Henry, are you inebriated? <laughs> Not on your tintype, dear fearless Fizzy of the fighting fusiliers. Anyway, if I were, I'd be drunk, not inebriated. You mean the war we never got to fight? Well, that was hardly our fault. Of course it wasn't. Do you know, I suppose I should be ashamed, but I'm not glad it's over, not one bit. I never expected to feel so free and, uh, and emancipated ever. Now, that's a peculiar thing to say. Why? Isn't it time I was? Don't you want to be? Well, I don't consider myself enslaved. All right. You finish your moxie and I'll down my beer and let's go over to Aunt Molly's together. Aunt Molly's? Well, you must be off your rocker. Why, that... A house of ill repute, eh? Now, that all depends on the point of view. I've never heard it anything but highly recommended, and I can vouch for that myself. Obviously, you can't handle your liquor. <laughs> oh, stop being such a stuffed shirt, Fizzy. You're going to be a doctor. You mustn't flinch at anything that has to do with the flesh. It's a new world, and a liberated one. There's no need to be coarse. First of all, you are talking to an engaged man. Second, you're a Philadelphian and ought to know better. And last, you know that Aunt Molly's is off limits to enlisted men? Well, you're right about the first and the last, but the second question is gravely open to doubt, or vice versa. You see, I now consider myself an American at large. Henry Peabody, you know what I think? What? I think the sooner you get back to Rittenhouse Square and your dear mother, the better off you'll be. Oh, dear Fizzy, I couldn't have agreed with you less. I'd had my taste of how the other half lived and had lingered sweet and pungent in the mouth and in all the vitals. I'm afraid those first two years after the war, I was both an enigma and a terrifying, inexplicable burden to my mother. But I felt that my cutting of her apron strings was something we both had to face. Until that terrible day when her life began to come to an end. Oh, 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 oh. Darling, what is it? What's happened? I, I, I don't know. I, I've been getting rather tired these days for some reason, and... Henry, help me up. Oh, this is most unseemly. Mama, what is it? I don't know. Oh, it's just like Dr. Parker Godwin to go and die on me. At my age, I'm much too old to start with another doctor. Mama, I won't let you not have one. Tell you what, I'll call Fizzy. He can give you a look-see. Lambert Fizzy? 
Oh, but he's only a boy, like you. You may not have noticed, but boys tend to grow up. Is he just passed his exams? He's been at Pennsylvania for his internship. At least he could sort of talk things over with you. I... Well, perhaps it would be in a matter of speaking, keeping things in the family. Uh, why don't we ask him to tea? Uh, say, tomorrow or, or the next day? And Fizzy came to tea very proper, in a pearl gray suit with a lavender tie and linen spats. Mother had what they have a name for nowadays, myasthenia gravis terminal and progressively more and more limiting, needing almost constant nursing and supportive care, and most important of all, affection, cheer, and love to keep the spirits up and the feeling of despair down. I had found a kind of freedom, only to lose it for the next ten years or so, and I have never regretted it, because in a peculiar way, it's how I found the woman in my life. I suppose the only thing that kept me reasonably sane through those years outside of the bottle was Aunt Molly and her various demi-mondaines. I was on my way there across Rittenhouse Square that evening when all of a sudden... Oh, look oh, uh, oh. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I haven't had much practice. <laughs> you mean in knocking people down? Here, here, let me help you up. Oh, no. Uh, no, thank you. No. Oh, I meant in riding a bicycle. <laughs> well, I should think not. Are you hurt? Oh, no. No. I never get hurt. Oh, but you, sir, are you? Uh, I don't think so, Miss... Uh... My name is Megan. Miss Megan? No. Megan. Just Megan. I was wounded to the heart, stricken with love at first sight. Oh, Megan, Megan, you're a taste in my mouth like spring strawberries, a smell like early hyacinths, a sound in my ears of my blood coursing through my veins. You are the beginning and the end, a symbol of life and death, yours and mine together. You were the best thing that ever happened to me, and the worst. I cannot think of you as evil, and yet... You were born to destroy. Megan, a strange and lovely name to taste on the tongue. Who was she? Where did she come from, suddenly? And how was she to affect the life of a man wrapped in a cocoon from which he ached to escape? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Prospero, the magician in Shakespeare's play The Tempest, who said that we are such stuff as dreams are made on. But he also went on to add, and our little lives are ended with a sleep. For nearly 50 years, Henry G.F. Peabody V has lived a strange life that sleep has not rounded or death come to still. Where has he lived it and how? That's his story, not mine. All those years ago, and I have only to shut my eyes, and the memory of Megan is as bright and clear as it was that first moment I met her. Was she tall, short, blonde, a brunette, brown-eyed, or blue-eyed? I can't answer you. Not because I don't remember, but only because I seem to remember she was all, or any of those. She was woman. She was desire. And she was glowing with an inner light that seemed to me to be the answer to all life and love. Megan. <laughs> it's a lovely name. It's short for Margaret. And it's Welsh. And it means, if it has to mean something, the child of light. What's your name? Peabody. Uh, Peabody? <laughs> well, Henry Peabody. Henry? You know what that means, don't you? No, I... I mean, well, what does it mean? The ruler of an enclosure of private property. It does. It does. Does it fit you? 
I suppose, in a way. That's your picture of yourself? Well, perhaps not what I want to be, what I am. Henry. <laughs> the name has other derivations. Teutonic. Hagen. You know what Hagen means? No. It means fierce warrior. Do you feel fierce, Henry? I feel a little embarrassed. <laughs> I guess that isn't very fierce. If you don't feel fierce, what do you feel? Hard to say. I'm, for the moment, I'm lost. Then let me help you find yourself. Your real self. Let's go. Where? Anywhere. See what we can find together. Bring the bicycle. <laughs> yes, of course. Where are we going? Where the four winds blow us. Where were you going? I, uh... To Aunt Molly's, the house across Walnut Street. What do you know about that? I know a lot I shouldn't know. And I wish I knew more than I've been allowed to. Who are you? What's your whole name? Megan. That's all. Enough. Take me as I am or not at all. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Let's go skinny dip in the fountain. What? <laughs> you heard me. I'm going. Take off your clothes and join me. I can't, Megan. I can't. You can do anything you want if you're only fierce enough, Henry. But it's insane. What would my mother or anyone say? A Peabody bathing nude in the fountain in Rittenhouse Square? Try and shed your Philadelphia crust. Shuck it like a snake skin. And be who you are, who you want to be, want to be, want to be. Hello. Yes, this is Dr. Fisdale. Who? Henry Peabody, indecent exposure. Well, I, 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 of, of, of course, I'll be right down and arrange to bail him out. Well, it's all arranged, Henry. You're free to come home. But what on earth possessed you to... What happened to Megan? Who? Megan. The girl who was with me when I was arrested. Henry, there was no one with you. You were all alone in your birthday suit, paddling in the fountain when you were arrested. I was alone? Is that all you're worried about? Have you seen the coverage in the bulletin? Did Mother? So far, I hope not. It's enough to send anyone into a decline. Now, my advice is to pay the fine, hush it up, and get back to the center track. You mean the main line? If they'll let you climb aboard. Henry, what possessed you? A girl who summed up all I was missing in life. And maybe you, Fizzy. Well, speak for yourself, Henry. I'm not in the process of going loony. What does that mean, going loony? I suggest you take a good, long, hard look at yourself and then ask me that question again. Now, let's get into old Lizzie, and I'll drive you home. If you'd asked me then, I suppose I'd have thought of it as my bill of divorcement, a term that was current. Certainly from that moment on, I was cut off from, oh, not exactly ostracized, but just avoided by most of my acquaintances. I didn't care, actually. I had the long tribulation of mother, and here I'm only speaking of the physical problem of caring for her. And I had this other life, half-life, dream existence, whatever it was with Megan. Yes, Hank? I wish you wouldn't call me that. Oh, do you? Would you rather I said Henry Gerard Flower Peabody Fifth? You know I don't like that either. And I don't like it neither. That's why I call you... Hank. All right. Hank it is. Only... Only what? Only I... These chance meetings in the park. It's not enough, Megan. There must be, there has to be more between us. Why, well, Hank? Are you making a proposal? No, well, I, all I meant was, can't we meet somewhere else? You should shun me, Henry. Why? Because I'm not safe. You don't know me or anything about me. Megan, I want to take you home to meet my mother. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think she could ever see me for dust. Why not? I have no family, no background. I'm not very safe at all. You want to take a girl home to meet Mother, take Prudence Holmes or Deborah Williams. I don't want Prudence or any other girl. I want... You want what? Me? 
Yes. Oh, Henry, ruler of the enclosure, be careful. I'm very dangerous. Who knows who I am? I might be Bronn, then, the love goddess. Or from Glen Cook in the southwest county of Dufet. Should you look below my left arm for the blue half-moon mark of the witch... Or maybe if you listen too close, you might find me one of the three birds of Rhiannon. The what? <laughs> Did you ever hear tell of them? Their song was so sweet that they could sing the dead to life. Or put the living into the sleep of death. Don't I worry you, Henry? Don't I frighten you? No. You only make me love you more. I want to be with you, live my life with you. Are you sure? It wouldn't be easy. I have no conscience, you know. <laughs> Is that why you left me alone with the bicycle and not a stitch of clothing waiting in that pool? <laughs> oh, poor Henry V. What did you say when the policeman caught you <laughs> once more into the breach? I'd rather have said once more into the breaches. <laughs> but that's past and done. We've seen each other enough since then. Megan, Megan, there has to be a way I can spend time with you. How then? I... I've taken a little apartment on Chatham Street. Could we, could we meet there? Or better still... Better still, would I move in and be there for you to come to? I don't want it to be this way, but I... But that's how it must be if it is to be. Well, why not, Hank? If you want to take the risk... Risk? What risk? Oh, don't worry, my sober-sided Philadelphian. I won't blow any whistles on you. I'll be glad to be your handmaiden. But what will you be to me? Your slave, Megan. Your willing slave. Remember that. I may call you to account one day. It was only three flights up. Philadelphia's old red brick houses don't run to many stories. And we had the top floor. Megan and I. Oh, it wasn't what you might think. Just a place to be alone. To grow drunk on the fragrance of her. To live a dream richer and more satisfying and soothing than any distillation of poppy seed or that bitter derivative of the cocoa plant, cocaine. A shield against the world that battered me every day. Henry? Henry? Yes, Mother? Where do you keep disappearing to? You're never about when I want you. I'm sorry. Far be it from me to complain, although I am dying by inches. I don't expect you to be at my beck and call every instance, of course, but these long absences, where do you go? What do you do? I have to get out of the house now and again, Mother. Well, naturally, of course. You always seem to pick the moments I feel my worst. One of these days, during one of these unexplained absences, I'll slip away. And you'll never forgive yourself, I hope, for not being here to brush back the angel of death. If I at least knew where to reach you. Well, sometimes I'm, I'm just taking a walk. Or having lunch with someone like, um, like Fizzy. Don't mention Lambert Fizdale's name in this house. He's the one who made a chronic invalid out of me. Mama, he only diagnosed your problem. He didn't give it to you. You mustn't think you're dying. I have no intention of doing so. That's the spirit. You'll outlive us all. Well, I don't know about that. But I do plan to live out my three score and ten. And that gives me a long time to go. I felt sick to my stomach at the thoughts that raced through my head. She probably would. But it was an eternally long time. And I was trapped. Hopelessly trapped. I carried a splitting headache with me to Chatham Street. And it was a long time alone with my darling. My head on her lap. Her hand gently stroking my brow before I felt the tension beginning to ease. Feeling better, Hank? Yes. Oh, you've got to do something about it, you know. Something about what? Mama, if you want to have me, 
or anyone like me. What are you talking about? You know, there's no use taking me home to meet her. She wouldn't understand about you. And if Mama doesn't understand, you can't run away, can you? She has the money. I have no job. I don't know what kind I could get, but whatever it was, it would be a long time before I... We've been all over this before ad nauseum, Hank. You know as well as I do. There's only one way to make Mama loose the purse strings. Oh. For her to die. Myasthenia gravis. There's no definite prognosis. There are constant remissions and the progress is slow. There's no telling when that will happen. Oh, yes, there is. What do you mean? Well, if she won't die by herself, you'll just have to arrange it for her, Hank. stares at her calm, untroubled face in horror, aware of all the sensual promise of his beloved, drawn irresistibly to her with desire. I think we should leave him to digest her shocking suggestion until I return shortly with Act Three. Is that what the ethereal Megan is suggesting? Is she perhaps, after all, as she herself hinted, a descendant in the second decade of the 20th century of some ancient line of Welsh witches? Or is she just a Welsh girl from West Philadelphia on a predatory quest for a rich man? Or for that matter, any girl who just is trying to create an air of mystery to gain what? Wealth? Social position? power? Even today, across that gap of nearly half a century, the stinging shock that jolted me as I faced Megan and her amazing suggestion still sears and burns. Why not? She's going to die. But in her own good time. What's good about it? It could take years, and we're not growing any younger, either of us. Stop it. Stop it. Don't say anything. Oh, sooner or later, you're going to have to face it and make your decision. No, no, Megan. Yes, and it will have to be sooner, Hank. Sooner than soonest. I told you, I can't wait for life to come to me. It's slipping past too fast. I have to go out and grab it. Gobble it up while I can still digest it. Catch it. Before it passes me by. I won't listen to you anymore. I'm not going to stay. No, you can't run away from me, Hank. I have you in my spell. You can't get away. I can and I will. The faster you run, the closer I'll be on your heels. You can't get away. Never, never until she's dead. <laughs> I fled as if I were pursued by the hound of heaven. I was smothering, suffocating, my stomach churning, her laughter ringing in my ears. And then I was out into the front door, stumbling blindly into the street, the door closing behind me, careless of my usual precautions, before leaving that secret clandestine rendezvous and running full tilt into fizzy before I could stop myself. Oh, good Lord, oh. man. Why don't you look where you're going? <laughs> For heaven's sake, Henry Peabody. Where have you been hiding yourself lately? Sorry, fizzy accent. I didn't see where I was going. Can't stop. I... Ah, you oh, lost if you'd seen a ghost. Whatever it is, you're in shock, Henry. We've got to get you at least sitting down for a moment. Now, come on now. Lean on me. I'm taking charge for the moment. Now, go ahead. Finish that brandy. I'm not sure I... Do as you're told. <sighs> You just sit back and let me loosen your tie. <clears throat> there. Let me see. No fever. But your pulse is racing as if you'd had an electric shock. What on earth happened to you? Something I can't talk to you about. Well, what are you doing in this part of town anyway? Uh, please, don't question me. Now, don't tell me, Henry, you have a mistress stashed away in a little love nest. I, I'm not going to tell you anything. I, I can't, Fizzy. I wouldn't dare. But it's all in confidence. I wish I could ask for help 
but I can't. There's no way. I'm speaking first as a doctor. I don't need a doctor. Well, then, as a friend. Or a friend. And I'm telling you, you do. I don't know what's happening to you, Henry, but you're a nervous wreck. Someone has to help you. No. No one can do that but myself. No one. Henry? Henry? Oh, where is that boy? Henry! I'm right here, Mama. Oh, yes. But where have you been all afternoon? I've had everyone hunting high and low for you, and no one could find a trace. I, uh, I was with Fizzy. We had something to talk over. About me? No, no, Mother, we... You're sure? Well, I... Why, dear? Because just about an hour ago, not so long after you left me, I had the strangest and most terrible attack. I saw everything double. And my hands and my arms and my eyes and my... My mouth was so tired, I couldn't hold them up. I couldn't swallow... I felt exactly as if someone was trying to choke me to death. I kept calling for you, Henry, and calling and calling to help me, to save me. I'm sorry, Mama, but I'm here now. Yes, dear. You're here. And I feel so much safer. Oh, Henry, my darling, don't leave me alone again. I'll try not to. I don't want to die alone. And something tells me I will if you're not close by. Now, put another pillow behind my head, dear. Help me sit up a little. I still feel a little choked. Difficult to breathe. Henry? Hmm? What are you doing? Just standing, holding the pillow like that. Put it behind my back. I did as I was told, automatically. What was racing through my mind was the answer I might have made to Mother's question. What had I been going to do with that pillow? I mean, what might I have done with it? Hammering at the back of my brain was that fellow's line just before he smothered Desdemona. Put out the light, and then put out the light. Appalled by the seed that Megan had sown in my head, even more appalled by the thoughts that had sprouted from it, for almost two weeks I scarcely left the house. Conscience-stricken and ashamed, I tended my mother hand and foot, resolutely trying to strike Megan out of my mind. But it was no good. Eventually, I found my way back to her. Come in, Hank. I've been expecting you. I couldn't stay away. I thought you couldn't. How's Mama? What? Oh, she, she's fine. She seems better. I'm sorry to hear it. Megan, you don't mean that. But of course I do. She's the only thing that stands between us and the life we want, isn't she? I can't believe you would dare say such things so openly. Take that back or I won't be back. I can't. But you'll be back, Hank. You'll be back. I swore I wouldn't. The pull was too strong. Besides, there was something about the way she looked. Within a week, I was back. Come in, Hank. What happened to your key? I, I forgot it at home. I can't stay long. Oh? How's Mama? I don't want to talk about her. What do you want to talk about? You. I thought the last time I was here that, that you didn't look well. In what way? I thought maybe you, you weren't getting enough to eat. That isn't what you thought. You thought I looked older. And you were right. You see? Crow's feet coming around my eyes. Deep wrinkles by my mouth. Soon the flesh will begin to sag, the hair to turn dull. I told you. I had a fury about living. I have to take life in gulps and savor it in great bunches because I haven't time. It's passing me by. 
only one way you can save me. How? I told you, get rid of her. Again I fled, and the battle raged inside me, tearing me apart. Mother was in a remission herself again, difficult, cantankerous, demanding at her most stifling. That last one evening was the climax. What's the matter, Henry? You seem so fidgety. I don't know, Mama. It seems stifling to me. I, I need a breath of fresh air. Oh, well, if it were hard to breathe for anyone, it would be me with my condition. Now, just settle down. Plump up my pillows, dear, and then you can read to me. I'd be glad to later, but first, you've really got to excuse me. Oh, don't go off and leave me tonight, dearest. But you said you were feeling so well. I am. But I'm afraid of being alone. And also, I... Also what? I, I, I don't know. I have the eeriest feeling tonight, as if there was someone else in the room. A cold, strange presence... Oh, now, give me the pillow, dear. I've just got to get away. From your own mother? Oh, don't be silly. I'll never let my boy go. Now give me the pillow. I blacked out. I just don't remember anything. Until suddenly I was with Megan, and her voice came to me as though drifting out of a fog. Kill her. Kill her. We have nothing. I can't. I could kill you for even suggesting it. I'm rooted too deep inside you. You'd have to tear me out, rout me out, dig me out like a dandelion root. You'd have to kill me to get rid of me. And you wouldn't dare. You haven't the courage. I warn you, don't drive me too far. The problem is I haven't driven you far enough. I waited too long. And now you see me as ugly. I am ugly. Hideous. If you're ever going to do it, it had better be now while you still have the chance. Uh, this is the apartment where you killed her? Yes. You say you smothered her with a pillow. That's right. Mm. Where is she? In there. The bedroom. All right, stay with him, Sergeant. I'll go have a look-see. What is going on here, Mr. Gerard? Hmm? Oh, Mrs. Clark. Hmm. Nothing. Nothing to bother you. I don't know about that. I do not like the police in my building. What has happened? You can ask the sergeant here. Better still, here comes Lieutenant Quinn. He can tell you. Hey, excuse me, Lieutenant. I am Mrs. Clark, the landlady... I want to know what is going on. Well, now that makes two of us, Mrs. Clark. From what I can find out so far, nothing. Didn't you find Megan? There's no one in that other room, either dead or alive, Mr. Peabody. Peabody? He said his name was Gerard. Oh, now, I wonder, Mrs. Clark, if I could have a word with you first... We took her aside, but not so far that I couldn't overhear what they were saying, even if it made no sense. And you're absolutely sure. Mr. Lieutenant, I'm a widow woman, and I keep a close eye on all my tenants. I don't have enough problems without them. I thought he was a writer, because he came here alone all the time. I can tell you one thing for sure, Lieutenant. There wasn't no woman living there, let alone visiting. I don't stand for none of that nonsense in my house. <laughs> have you been, Henry? Does it matter? I think it does. Your, uh, your mother. What about Mama? Why, she's dead, Henry. The maid called me. She, she was dead when I got here. How? Respiratory failure. You mean she just stopped breathing? Well, it's not uncommon in her condition. I, I just wouldn't have expected it so suddenly. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to suggest, Lieutenant. Smothered? Why? Well, I can only tell you what my report will be. 
And I'm quite sure an autopsy wouldn't change it. Cause of death? Acute myasthenia gravis resulting in respiratory failure. About the other, as a doctor, there never was any woman named Megan. She was a phantom, a figment of my poor friend's disordered brain. So long ago, nearly 50 years, Fizzy is gone, a lieutenant, Megan, Mama, only I live on. For what? Oh, I'm happy enough here. I'm not nearly so mad and disjoined as they like to think me. And thank heaven there's enough money. Why do I stay? I'll tell you why. First, because I'll never admit there was no Megan. A man has to have at least one woman to love and cherish and remember in his life. And second, Damn if they only knew. I believe I killed someone. Smothered her with a pillow till she could breathe no more. If it wasn't Megan, then... It could only have been my mother. That's the real horror. For which I deserve to be punished. To quote from Henry Peabody's favorite poem, The Hound of Heaven... My mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap. My days have crackled and gone up in smoke. And when at last the hound caught up, he said, Thou dravest love from thee, who dravest me. I'll be back shortly. of any society are a pendulum that swings from side to side under the pressure of events and the changing whim of human nature. If we are permissive today, we were equally repressive yesterday, or will be tomorrow. Why does the human spirit always act and react so violently? Somewhere in the middle would be the best, wouldn't you say? But the pendulum never stops there. Our cast included Herd Hatfield, Patricia Elliott, Ian Martin, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.